Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the South African Investment Summit panel for today. My name is JP van der Madver. I'm the head of investment promotion for Westgrow, which is the Western Cape's trade investment and tourism promotion agency in South Africa. Uh, we have an esteemed group of panelists here today um, and, as, and as speakers with, with us too. Um, and so I'd first like to introduce Mr. J Jimmy Ranamane, who is the general manager for global markets for Brand SA, and he's going to do a bit of a scene setter for us on South Africa as a business destination. Over to you, Jimmy. Thank you, JP. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced, I am Jimmy Ranamane. Uh, General Manager for Global Markets at Brand South Africa. Uh, Brand South Africa is the official marketing and reputation management agency for the country. And my role here, as JP indicated, is to uh, set the scene and give you an overview of who South Africa is as an investment destination. As South Africa, we believe that uh, the country is actually a country that is forging ahead and breaking new grounds and inspiring new ways, despite the number of challenges that we face as a country. And we actually boost a population of around 60 million, which means we are a relatively small country by population. However, the country continues to make significant impact across geopolitics, global economics, arts, culture, sport, and other sectors. In terms of our gross domestic product, we are estimated to have a gross domestic product of around 1.174 trillion USD, cementing South Africa's position as a globally re relevant comp and competitive economy in emerging markets. And some of the sectors that contribute to our GDP include personal services, financial, re real estate, and business services, construction, manufacturing, mining, and quarrying, just to name a few. Uh, in terms of demarcation as South Africa, we have nine provinces, with the major contributors to our GDP being Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, and Western Cape with Gauteng sitting at 34.1%, uh, KwaZulu Natal sitting at 16%, and the GDP in the Western Cape, or contribution by the Western Cape, sitting around 14%. And the sectors that contribute much to our GDP from these provinces include trade, media, manufacturing, financial and banking sectors, the creative industries, oil and gas, logistics, manufacturing, textiles, and automotive sectors. Whilst also in the Western Cape, we see tourism and the ocean economy being dominant in terms of contribution to the GDP. Now, a snapshot of who we are in the global scheme when it comes to uh, the, uh, our economy. We are actually a vibrant emerging market. We are a, the most diverse economy in the African continent. We boost the largest presence of multinationals uh, in the continent, we are rich in natural resources. We actually also boost a secure financial services and banking sector and world-class infrastructure. Now, why invest in South Africa? We are a leader in mining and mineral resources. South Africa's non-energy minerals are estimated to be around 2.4 trillion upwards, making it the wealthiest mining jurisdiction in the world. We also, as I said, boost a secure and sophisticated financial services sector. South Africa has a sophisticated banking sector with a major footprint in Africa, with the Johannesburg Stock, Stock Exchange being the largest stock exchange by market capitalization on the continent. We also boost quality infrastructure in efficient logistics. Uh, we boost well-established infrastructure. South Africa is actually well-positioned as a key global hub and, and, and an attractive gateway to the continent. We boost the largest presence of multinationals, as I indicated earlier, with more than 180 of the Fortune 500 companies with presence in South Africa, and most of them actually pledging at the recent South Africa Invest Conference and reinvesting in the country. We are a manufacturing hub, our diverse manufacturing sector means sectors can, uh, uh, means investors can pick industries they wish to explore. Niche industries such as food processing, beverages, motor manufacturing, wood products have rich maturity and are ripe for foreign direct investment. We actually provide access to regional markets. South Africa has several agreements with majority of the 55 countries which signed the Africa Free Trade 
uh, area. And this means the country provides investors with an export platform to these other markets in the continent. With the country committing to decarbonize the economy within a range of 350 to 420 million tons uh, by 2030, it means the country requires a funding in the region of 1.5 trillion over the next five years. And we are looking at multiple sources for that funding from developed countries, private sector, investors, de and development finance institutions. And this investment is actually directed at three key sectors which is electricity generation, new energy vehicles, as well as green hydrogen. Now, in terms of testimony that we are an investable country, uh, at the recent South African Investment Conference, commitments in terms of investment around the region of 1.51 trillion were made by companies from a number of countries with the business process, so, uh, business process outsourcing sector, as well as ICT and digital sectors, uh, lending uh, investment around 131 billion, followed by energy sector with around 120.5 billion, development finance around 39.6 billion, uh, infrastructure, property and logistics around 23.4 billion, food and beverages around 21.9 billion, Mining and, uh, and mineral beneficiation sitting at around 21.7 billion. Vice manufacturing was sitting at 12.7 billion. Special economic zones sitting at around 11.3 billion. Well, and healthcare chemicals and advanced materials sitting at 2.8 billion. And this is just testimony that we are investable. And this investment came from a number of countries which include the USA, UK, France, Russia, Germany, Nigeria, the Netherlands, Turkey, Denmark, Tanzania, and even South African companies reinvested or invested in their own country because they believe in the country. Now, as I close, uh, I just want to give you a snapshot you like of who we are a as a country. Where two worlds intersect, Thank where you. first world infrastructure meets an emerging market, where science and technology enjoy rapid advancement, a land where innovation creates a dynamic environment for growth. Where a market of almost 60 million people provide you with the perfect springboard to access a continent of 1.3 billion people. Welcome to the future. Invest in South Africa. Thank you very much, Jimmy. That, I think, was a great way to set the scene um, for our panel discussion. And I just want to further drill down upon one point. Um, I think, you know, South Africa is in the press sometimes for some negative reasons. But I think the one thing that no one can deny is that South African businesses, South African people, and society is defined by resilience. And out of that resilience um, comes an ability to problem solve, to tackle challenges. And I think that's one of the reasons there are so many globally competitive and world-leading firms across a number of sectors, including mining, ICT, food and beverage, and financial services. You know, looking at companies like Discovery, Dimension Data, uh, South African breweries, and De Beers, you, you get a sense of the reach that South African companies have all over the world. So I'd like everyone to kind of think about that resilience in relation to South African the South African environment and how we, how we do business as a country and, and how businesses work in our country. So I'd now like to formally introduce um, our, our esteemed group of panelists. Uh, from the JSC, we have Ms. Patricia kulov the for Business Development Manager. From ACN Capital, we have Carl Nietling, who's the CEO. From Vedant Capital, we have Edmund Higginbottom, who's the Managing Director. From the Department of Forestry, Fisheries uh, and the Environment, uh, the national government, we have Lisa Mazzaleni. From the Western Cape government, uh, we have Ms. Marae Wenger. She is the Provincial Minister for Finance and Economic Opportunities. Um, and from the city of Cape Town, we have Alderman James Foss. He's the MMC for Economic Growth. So we have an esteemed group of panelists who will hopefully be able to share a little bit more about the investment environment in South Africa um, with a focus on a couple of the regions. And so I'd like to get started um, by 
firstly, asking the panelists if you can keep your responses to about two to three minutes each, um, so we can save a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and then I think we'll kick off the questions uh, to Patricia. Patricia, please tell us a bit more about the Johannesburg Stock Exchange um, and your strategic focus with regards to new listings. Thank you. Um, so like it was previously mentioned, we are the largest and most liquid African exchange on the continent, over 130 years worth of operations. Has really given us an opportunity to kind of be placed that way. We're around the 18th largest um, globally. Um, so as an exchange, we have facilitated um, capital raising for both South African companies and offshore companies. Um, and um, hence, a lot of the companies that you, JP, had mentioned, you know, these are companies that you could say were essentially incubated in South Africa. You look at the Richmond Group, you look at SAB, you look at a number of these global players where they've used the capital markets of South Africa to raise money, and then as they grow, they then seek to obviously explore perhaps outside the borders of South Africa. So as an exchange, um, our value proposition is really access to capital for both South African and offshore listed companies. Um, about a third of the JSC's companies are foreign incorporated. Um, so we do have quite a lot of offshore companies, not only from a, from a, a domicilian perspective, but also operations perspective. Um, and hence, that is our strategic objective from a listing perspective, to say how do we grow, facilitate, work alongside various government in, uh, uh, um, institutions as well in terms of facilitation of capital, either through green bonds like we did with the city of Cape Town with the billion rand bond issuance that was done in 2017. We've also had our first Cook um, sustainable, sustainability linked bond, um, which of course was uh, issued by 274. Um, and then also, like I say, the pure equity play in terms of facilitation of capital and also facilitating additional liquidity pool for companies that are located here in London or elsewhere um, looking for additional liquidity. So just on the London part, very quickly, our sweet spot is definitely FTSE 250 companies that have been hard hit from a liquidity perspective and are struggling to access capital in the markets here. And we've had phenomenal success. Um, Schroeder, Sirius, there's another one coming, Primary Healthcare, which have been all pleasantly and well received by the South African investors. Well, it sounds like a very positive story, so thank you for that, for that scene setter. Edmund, I'm gonna bring you in here. You obviously represent a slightly different part of the investment um, world. Could you give us some insight into private capital and particularly your thoughts on the private credit market in South Africa? Thank you very much. So, a lot of the talk in the private capital market over the last two, three years has been around private credit. Private credit seen as an expanding asset class. It seems to be you know, expanding in absolute terms while actually private capital in Africa is probably shrinking at the margin, including in South Africa. Uh, private credit seen as <coughs> offering a very strong risk reward combination for investors is seen as providing investors with a lot more certainty around term structure around the tenor of their funds, a lot of downside protection, and a lot more certainty regarding currency uh, and potential currency risk. And we see private credit continuing to expand as a proportion of the overall private capital pool. Uh, we see it looking at becoming much more broad in terms of more specialist funds with specific private credit strategies. So Verdant Capital, for example, is investing uh, pri private credit into the financial services sector, so it's quite differentiated from some of the existing uh, private credit players. As we, as we look at South Africa versus rest of Africa and rest of emerging markets, uh, one thing that's very positive for entrepreneurs and business people in South Africa is actually it's quite a developed credit market with a broad range of banks and other types of institutions domestically serving that market. Uh, and the rates are actually slightly lower in South Africa on a currency adjusted basis than, for example, Kenya or Uganda. And, uh, and that's a sort of bit of a two-edged blade because yes, businesses in this market in South Africa are able to raise funding slightly more cheaply, but it does mean it's a less attractive market for FDI into South Africa. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we, we as an investment community in South Africa, we need to build on our strengths. We need to build on that domestic private credit market and try and build liquidity. Uh, Verdant Capital, as well as being a private credit manager, we are 
uh, we're looking to enter the uh, JSC listed bond market next year and start, uh, start with JSC programs, just taking advantage of the fact that there, there is uh, you know, good value um, uh, funding, uh, a good value capital market in South Africa and RAND, which, which there isn't in, in, in other markets. So I think we have to continue to build on that. And I think we also need to think about how we can export that strength into the surrounding regions as well, into other, other RAND block countries, whether that's uh, Sutu or Swazi or, 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 or Namibia and uh, see if we can you know, broaden the reach of our capital market for that, with, with that mechanism. Thank you for those insights. Um, Carl, similarly, you're in um, the private equity space. Could you explain a little bit more about the advantages you see in the private equity markets, um, how this has evolved in recent years, and, and maybe a little bit on how you see it changing in the years to come? Uh, JP, thanks. Um, I think, uh, personally, I haven't been this excited about uh, the private equity sector in South Africa um, from our perspective for since 2008. But I don't share the sentiment for the, the private equity sector in general. Um, I think I share the sentiment of Edmund that um, the sector is shrinking somewhat uh, in real terms. Um, and there's, there's a very good reason for it. Um, I think the, the capital allocators in South Africa and throughout the world for th that give capital to South Africa, um, they, they mold the direction of the industry. Um, and you have two, we're at a crossroads. We have two divergent pools of capital. One would be the DFIs and the pension funds. And we've seen some very positive news about uh, female-owned and black female-owned fund managers that have received capital. Um, and some of the family offices that we deal with, once coincidentally last night, reached out to me and said, listen, would you allocate capital to, to, to this specific fund? I said, I would 100% allocate capital to that team, but I wouldn't al allocate capital to that mandate because the mandate sometimes is being dictated by the pension funds and the DFIs. The alternative pool of capital would be private capital that goes to the private markets. And that's where I do believe there is an opportunity currently. And it is capital that has capital with a conscience. So it's not ignoring ESG, uh, ignoring um, employment uh, growth, but does have a slightly wider mandate and not such a, a, a tick the box strict mandate. So I, I'm excited about the, the, the opportunities in South Africa because I think the market is ripe for pricing for several years, I think the market was uh, overheated and, and it's not there anymore. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it's going. But um, from our side, and I'll use it as an example what we're working on now. I'm a private equity specialist and despite that, I'm actually currently the CEO of a listed company, so it's kind of ironic. But the reason for that is to take this group private. Um, and it'll be a half a billion rand transaction, give or take, um, not trying to market sensitive information out there, but that's more or less the, the, the range that we will look at. And it's three investors, three private investors, half a billion rand will have half a billion rand of assets under management. It's an easier process, right? And the market has matured. And you have 20, 30 years ago, aspiring investment bankers that couldn't make it in, private, uh, in, in investment banking, they went to private equity. It's almost the opposite now. You have really good people, you have really good people that aspire to become into private equity, and they just need the capital. So I think it's an exciting road going forward with a lot of opportunities. Thank you, Carl. So I think we've got a bit of a, a good overview of both the listing market and, and the private equity market. Um, I'm going to move on to MEC Wenger. MEC, you represent the government of the Western Cape, um, particularly in the finance and economic opportunity space. How does the province approach its economic development strategy, um, including a focus on investment? Uh, thank you, JP. Uh, just f uh, for the audience, just to locate us, uh, I represent the Western Cape government. We're one of South Africa's nine provinces uh, with the third largest population of 7.3 million inhabitants. We've recently launched our economic growth strategy called Growth for Jobs, and it is centered around private sector enablement. Uh, so the strategy looks at factors of production and horizontal enablement of the private sector, 
is we understand that it's the private sector that creates jobs, and our job as government is to make that as easy as possible. Our goal is to create a trillion rand provincial economy that's growing at between 4 and 6% by 2035. How are we going to do that? Uh, we're focusing on seven uh, areas, and investment is one of them. Uh, so we're looking to uh, increase private sector investment in our province from 13%, uh, which is what it is currently, to 20% by 2035. We we'll also have a firm focus on exports and developing our exports uh, from the Western Cape to the world. We'd like to triple exports, uh, including tourism. We'd like to double the number of tourists. And on that front, we're doing exceptionally well. Uh, we will breach a million inbound passengers in our summer season uh, this year. Uh, the Western Cape is a wonderful place to visit and to invest. Uh, we're also looking, of course, at uh, the key binding constraints on the economy, for example, energy and our transition to net zero carbon. We're looking at water resilience as a, a water-scarce region. Uh, we have uh, extensive plans to make sure that water is not a hindrance to the economy. We're uh, looking at um, infrastructure and mobility, tech and innovation, and then, of course, skills and employability. And if we put that all together, uh, that is our pathway to a growing Western Cape economy. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, you represent national government, but in a very specific area. Um, how does the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment position a strategy to target aquaculture as a prospective investment sector for foreign funding? Thanks, JP. So in terms of aquaculture across the country, it is a government priority and it falls under the ocean's economy. We have a strategy that has been implemented since 2014 around that. And as government, we have done some great projects that make it conducive for an investor, foreign investors to come in place. Uh, an example is we've demarcated aquaculture development zones across the country. So these zones would have bulk infrastructure, they'd have environmental authorization already in place, and it's easy for a farmer or an investor to come and plug and play. We've got fine, um, financial incentives that's dedicated to aquaculture. So we, as government said, we're gonna take the risk with you. We've got a reimbursement grant um, with aquaculture where you can get up to 1 million USD back on cost spent on machinery, feed, um, a mentorship as well, any assets that you buy. And we work closely with um, sort of government agencies such as Westgro and others across the country to ensure that there's an ease of doing business for investors, especially in the aquaculture space. Thank you. Alderman Foss, you represent the city of Cape Town, which is obviously very well known as a tourism destination. But what I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about and tell the audience about is why is a city such a great place to actually do business um, and potentially a base for international investors to launch into the rest of the continent of Africa? And what sectoral strengths do you see the city having that you're trying to build on? Thank you so much, JP, and to the South Africans in the audience, Hwe Mora, Moweni. Thank you for those questions because it is, uh, goes to the heart of how we want to position Cape Town, both as an investment destination, but also as a, a leisure destination. So, of course, it's important for us to um, break down those barriers as investors see us probably as the most beautiful city to visit, and therefore we are now working around the clock to look at all of the investment opportunities and sectoral support that we provide to those key industries from manufacturing, energy, water, mobility, innovation, technology, business process outsourcing, which is now one of our biggest uh, performing sectors in Cape Town. We like to think of Cape Town as the call center hub of Africa and beyond financial services. So as you can see, Cape Town has got a lot of top performing sectors. So it's important for the city government then to focus on those sectors with skills development, workforce development, and attracting more investment into those sectors that can improve productivity for existing businesses, but also to look at how to support new investments coming into the city. And so there we deploy a dedicated investment facilitation service to investors that looks at fast tracking of construction permits, electricity connections, building plan approvals, as well as deploying financial and non-financial incentives 
to help those companies set up shop in Cape Town, but at the same time to look at exporting those products from Cape Town to key source markets. So connectivity for Cape Town is key in terms of travel and trade so that we can get products to market fast, uh, seamless, because we are a long haul destination located at the southern tip of the African continent. Therefore, we need to constantly think about positioning our products for new markets, but also increasing uh, investment into the city using technology and innovation as a springboard uh, into the continent. And so business investment is was absolutely key so that it supports all of the other linked industries. And if you look at energy, for example, we will now be investing as the city government uh, a huge amount of money into energy generation distribution so that we can look at new type of energy uh, provision, renewables, so that we can make Cape Town a future fit economy by focusing on wind and solar and sun. Um, and therefore, we have now made available uh, tenders to independent power producers to set up a solar farm in Cape Town, to look also at a power for cash program so that businesses that are uh, providing excess energy, that we can pay them for that energy. Uh, also investments into a hydro pump scheme facility so that we can give existing businesses a reduction in the load shedding and over time to be completely load shed free so that we have an independent power operation in Cape Town to become the superpower for the continent and focusing specifically on renewables and green technology manufacturing. So it's all exciting uh, opportunities, things that we have explored extensively with the help of private sector and experts in the value chain so that we can focus on our strengths and position Cape Town then as that go-to city. Just the last thing about skills, my colleague uh, Murray touched on the skills. So in Cape Town and the Western Cape, we don't do just training for training's sake. We want to train Cape Townians for the high growth sectors. So all of the skills programs that we currently run are for financial services, manufacturing, productivity, so that we can increase the employability and the talent of our workforce in Cape Town to make them ready for those future jobs that will come. So skills is a cornerstone of how we approach the economy with skills pipelines into call centers, into marine manufacturing and everything oceans so that we can really position Cape Town as the go-to city in the continent and beyond. And then lastly, ease of doing business. My colleague Lisa touched on it. We have just launched in Cape Town an ease of doing business index. Previously, the World Bank uh, ranked cities accordingly, and they've now uh, discontinued their ease of doing business ranking in 2018. And so earlier this year, the city government in Cape Town introduced our own ease of doing business index, focusing on 10 specific business facing indicators, making it easier for businesses to obtain construction permits, business licenses, etc., so that we can do things with speed and capability to make it easier for investors to find their way into the Cape. Thank you. Thank you very much. So hopefully we're starting to paint a positive picture for all of you in the audience. Um, Edmund, I'd like to come back to you and, and talk a little bit more about some of these opportunities that have been talked about by your fellow panelists in the aquaculture and tech sectors. What are your views on those sectors and the potential in South Africa? JP, thank you very much indeed. And with, with apologies to the other panelists and yourself, JP, in the audience. I'm going to have to uh, leave and go to another panel in, in a few minutes. So I'll probably address your question and then excuse myself. Uh, so we uh, just a lot of the comments of the panelists really resonate. So South Africa is still a very diverse, very attractive, very good value for money, human capital pool. Uh, you know, when I say good value, and clearly that's a comparative statement. If you look at some of the costs of um, skills, operations, whether that's West Africa, East Africa, Europe, North America. Uh, you know, South Africa is very, very attractive. Some of that is due to the devaluation of the currency, candidly, that, you know, as, as the currency gets weaker, South Africa becomes a more and more attractive market to export human capital skills from. I think panelists have mentioned a range of those industries which benefit from that theme, whether that's professional services, whether that's business processing, outsourcing, where BPO or call certain centers and similar similar outsourcing, 
uh, and tech, you know, tech is ultimately exporting human capital, whether that's package in the form of a business or whether that's exporting services in the form of software development. It is, it is a human capital intensive industry. So we do see a very, very diverse pool, a very strong pool of good value human capital, and that's one of the strengths of this business, this, this economy in South Africa. One of the weaknesses I'd say about South Africa is getting work permits in South Africa. That's something that we grapple with at Verdant Capital. Uh, we grapple with getting work permits for the right skills from elsewhere in the continent. That's not to say that we're hiring people from other African countries instead of hiring South Africans. Inevitably, um, successful businesses, successful professional services firms, successful investors want to hire a mix of people with different backgrounds and different skills. And ultimately, if, um, if we can't get work, speaking from a Ver oh, sorry, <laughs> speaking from Vernon Capital point, if we can't get work permits in South Africa, we will hire people in other markets and we'll move people to other markets. And South Africa loses from that. And there's no there's no upside to this. And yeah. we see the same in, in our tech clients. Our, our tech clients are like Cape Town, like the market here. One of the challenges <laughs> is getting work permits for South Africa, and it's it's a bit of a lose lose, unfortunately. Thank you for those inputs. I know the Alderman and the MEC will probably talk to those challenges because I know it's very high up, either number one or two on our advocacy list um, that, that we try and talk to national government about. Um, I know there's been some movement on a startup visa um, as well as a, a, a digital nomad visa. So those types of things are ways in which we're trying to kind of move that conversation, the, the, the province is trying to move that conversation forward for the country. But I'm going to now move over to Carl. I think we've, we've heard about some of the opportunities. Edmund has kind of Started. Thank you very much for your contribution, you. Edmund. Um, he's talked to, started to talk about some of the challenges, because I think we also have to be honest about what the challenges are. But I think we also want to look at where those challenges potentially present opportunities. So in terms of the businesses you're involved with, Carl, um, where, where do the main challenges exist? And, and how are you overcoming that uh, in your business and, and the businesses that you may be investing in? Um, <clears throat> JP, thanks. I actually just want to add on to what Edmund has said. Um, I think if we, uh, even just visas, it might not even be um, work permits. Um, if, we could, if we could have a process that worked better there, um, Cape Town specifically, the Western Cape, because now they've all excited me about the Western Cape, but um, is a preferred destination because the infrastructure works, because most things work just slightly better, because we have less load shedding. Um, we have business partners um, throughout the world, specifically uh, Europe um, and the Far East, that where um, the Western Cape specifically has lost seminar investment opportunities where we were the, they were going to spend three, four million rand each to host in South Africa, but visa challenges just decide, caused them to move it elsewhere. I think some of it went to Dubai, some of it went into Africa somewhere. So if we could address those things, that would make a, lot, a, a big difference. When it comes to opportunities, I think South Africa is a changing environment. Um, and sometimes you don't see the opportunity until it kind of stares you in the face. But where solar is changing businesses <clears throat> and making certain businesses more efficient, it's also changing where certain businesses that might have been marginal are now uh, very profitable. Um, so all of these changing situations in the country where people are leaving or becoming slightly more despondent, we, that's where we see the opportunities. There is, the, the, the opportunities are abound at the moment. Um, I am of the strong belief that in specific regions in South Africa, load shedding should be negligible 18 months from now. And if you wait until then, then, then your opportunity is not going to be there. So you, you need to look forward and you need to make the investments now because our investment horizons are five, six, seven years. So I'm just I'm hampering on the load shedding because that is a top of mind, right? And the corruption is there, all of that. Those things are being fixed. Um, behind closed doors, there are a lot of things that are being fixed that are not being presented to the market. We, our media does not present the, uh, the positive stories about people being arrested. It happens. They only present the, the negatives. I can see the, the upswell. I can see 
the change, and I can see that the private sector, the, the, the private companies, are starting to reinvest in the country again. So it's not just a specific sector. It's where things have changed, and where they say chaos creates opportunity. This is not necessarily chaos. I think the market has shifted, and it creates gaps where there are companies that are going to make, make profits, and specifically in manufacturing and exports. I think our currency will probably remain under pressure, which means there's a disparity which feeds off what Edmund says. Our cost per workforce is cheaper. Our electricity is becoming cheaper. Um, everything is becoming a little bit more attractive for an export-focused uh, business. Thank you, Cole. Um, so I think we've now identified some of the challenges, but again, I think Carl's also raised the good point about where, how those challenges represent opportunities. So MEC, I'd like to come back over to you to specifically talk about the power outages, also known as load shedding in South Africa, and how is the Western Cape government tackling this challenge, and what opportunities, as Carl started to allude to, um, present themselves for investors in these challenges, and if you'd like to also talk to the visa advocacy, sure. feel free to. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so, I mean, load shedding is a binding constraint on the economy, uh, and it is a key challenge, but it is also an opportunity. Uh, so as the provincial government, we're working very hard uh, to take this opportunity um, to not only decarbonize, but also to decentralize. So we have an energy council established by our premier, which brings in a whole of government approach and how we can support the private sector and also municipalities. So we have a very uh, strong municipal enablement program that we've been running for several years now. And that's aimed at uh, firstly providing policy certainty across the Western Cape. Uh, we have 23 municipalities, uh, already 22 of them have wheeling frameworks in place. We have uh, wheeling pilots in the city of Cape Town and in George, which is the um, largest secondary city in the province. They're ongoing at the moment. Um, we're looking at pooled buying mechanisms. And what we're trying to do is look at uh, em enabling municipal grids for independent power production. Our aim is to move away from ESCOM as the primary source of energy in our province and uh, to add 5,700 megawatts to the Western Cape by 2035. Uh, so we have uh, extensive teams working on it, uh, led by Mr. L.V. Lester, uh, who's the project manager for our provincial efforts. We're also focusing on our just energy transition, which is um, uh, uh, we're, pre we're actually preparing our own um, jet IP framework for the Western Cape, uh, as well as at the moment looking at uh, skills development. And we've already developed the first of its kind solar installation um, uh, courses at uh, TVET or uh, higher education training courses uh, as part of our contribution to the just transition. Uh, and of course, all of this is underpinned by good governance. Uh, there was mention of corruption in the Western Cape. We have zero tolerance approach to corruption. Uh, in the last financial year, we had across the board 100% of provincial government departments and entities with unqualified audits. So uh, a, a good place, a good place to invest. On the visas, agreed, it is um, a frustrating development, but something that uh, we're tackling head on. I have had numerous uh, engagements with the Home Affairs Department. We've also sent through constructive proposals on how to introduce the digital nomad visa without having to amend the Immigration Act. Uh, and my understanding is that it's very well advanced now and there should be some announcements imminently on the digital nomad um, front, as well as the startup visa. We're also working with the Department of Higher Education on amending the critical skills list to enable an easier pathway uh, for visas. And of course, it is, as you say, on our top uh, advocacy list of, of, of things to enable for the economy, because we understand that uh, we need uh, to attract skills in, into South Africa in order to grow and increase the complexity of our economy. Thank you. Um, Alderman Foss, so I think building on some of those issues raised by the MEC, um, particularly in energy, yeah. how, how is the city of Cape Town dealing specifically in your jurisdiction with energy challenges? But not just energy, we know Cape Town was in the press a few years ago for our severe drought, but the city has responded quickly to that, and how is the city addressing that in the long term in terms of your infrastructure across both energy, water, and other sectors? Thanks, JP. So the city government's approach to both water and energy 
very similar. We are investing significantly from the city's budget into those two areas, namely in water. We're looking at new water technology in terms of uh, extracting water from various sources so that we can uh, come to a point where we are having our own water availability and not reliable only on the state in terms of catchment so that we use new technologies and innovation for water resources, but also the reticulation of water to businesses and communities, a big focus so that we can get that reticulation in place um, because we don't want to see the system collapse. Um, we want to build confidence in terms of how we get water from source to business and community. And then the energy, very similar, making available uh, new initiatives for the private sector to tap into our energy plan. So we partner with independent power producers so that we can look at new innovation and technology when it comes to wind and sun. Uh, I've mentioned earlier, the city has made available land for new solar farm developments um, and simultaneously investing also in hydro pumped storage uh, schemes so that we can look at all of the available opportunities and not only in singular uh, opportunities, but there's a wide spectrum of opportunity in energy. So the budget is speaking specifically to projects that's being rolled out on the ground so that we can demonstrate to investors and citizens that we take water and energy very seriously as the city government in terms of our deployment of resources. Um, and then also looking at other options. For example, um, the Power Euros scheme, where we incentivize businesses in terms of their energy usage. We also deploy a curtailment into business nodes where we can give businesses uninterrupted power supply so that that also builds business confidence and giving more economic outcomes and performances in those economic nodes. Cape Town is quite unique in terms of its economic landscape. We have 27 economic nodes within the peninsula. And all of those economic nodes are close to where people live, work, and play. And that's why we want to see how we can make those economic nodes power hubs of the region so that we bring in more innovation into those areas with business retention and business expansion with specific programs and platforms helping those businesses with their energy, their water, and skills. So it's a, it's a full spectrum of, of how we approach those economic nodes. And then in terms of um, demonstrating how important energy is for us, we have just recently uh, started plans to build Africa's biggest gigawatt factory in Cape Town. And many other examples, solar panel manufacturing, wind turbine manufacturing, all of those factories are setting up shop in Cape Town. We also have a dedicated green technology zone called the Atlanta Special Economic Zone that focuses on businesses on green tech, providing incentives, fast tracking of services. So we're trying to, to do as much as we can in a very short space of time because we realize that for business, time is money. So we're using all of these special economic zones, incentives, and other skills programs to really fuel up uh, the opportunity that, uh, that faces us. And that's why this Africa's biggest gigawatt factory, the new solar panel manufacturing companies, all located now in the Cape, giving us a big opportunity for skills. So therefore the skills programs are closely linked to those new sectors that are opening up for Cape Town. So I think it's, it's, it's important to not only talk about these things, but also to show it in the budget. So as a city government, and I'm, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with how governments perform around the world, if it's on the budget and the plan is visible for people to see and the projects are happening on time, within budget, that shows that there's an absolute commitment from the city government uh, in Cape Town to get going on these important matters. Uh, because if we can get those things sorted, investment will flow then it makes it very easy for our investment teams to go and promote and to facilitate. And that's uh, the, the business sense that sits behind our, our program of action in Cape Town. Thank you very much. Well, it's a very positive story. 
So um, I'd like to now hear from Lisa to just to understand a little bit more about how you take that strategy that you've talked about on investment promotion and aquaculture and how you try and make it easier for businesses um, to, you know, to operate and, and to build their businesses and, and to attract new investment um, into that particular sector. Absolutely. So as government, we have done a lot of the legwork in terms of what you need to know in terms of different aquaculture species. We have done financial feasibility studies on over 10 different aquaculture fish um, species. So you can see what if a species you're farming, um, at what time you'll break even in terms of the model or the system that you're using. So we've done that legwork. That leg work. We also work closely with all our Invest South Africa offices um, across the provinces. So helping and guiding, uh, um, helping and guiding investors to know where to find land and sea space. We work closely with our sister departments in terms of um, authorizations or if there's bottlenecks, we try and, and undo that and unblock because we, are, we sit on various sort of working groups in terms of our development funding institutions as well as authorizations, which is obviously a very big thing in terms of aquaculture. Um, so yes, we work very closely on working groups and we've done a lot of the legwork in terms of financial feasibilities. So that information is there. We come as your technical support and your technical partner, um, um, as well as helping to find local partnerships when you come and land in South Africa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, Patricia, so I think the JC is well known for you know, having large companies listed on your exchange. But I think the, from what you've explained to us, you're doing a lot more work in other spaces on private placements and with SMEs. Could you describe a little bit more about that program and what it involves and who you're trying to target? Sure. So you can hear that there's an abundance of opportunities across South Africa and like many exchanges, um, that have responded accordingly to the growth in private markets, so have we as an exchange. So many exchanges globally have created platforms for private market capital raisings, which essentially facilitates the connectivity between a particular project, a company, and a potential investor. And that's something that the JSC is able then to um, use in terms of our global recognition, our local standing, to obviously put forward to the market and, 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 and build a viable platform that has got institutional investors, that has got high net worth individuals um, sitting behind that platform and essentially facilitates all these opportunities for capital raisings. So what the JSC has done is that we've invested in a, a UK fintech firm called Globacap. We have licensed this piece of technology to facilitate JSC private placement capital raisings on the exchange. Um, there's about 15, I think it is still 15 billion rand worth of investors that are sitting, um, so that's just under a billion dollars, sitting um, on the platform uh, with dry powder, of course, looking for opportunities. And this is growing on a daily basis. So for us, it's to say for those companies that are either not prepared or um, are not ready uh, to do a listing, let's facilitate a capital raising. Let's bring them into the capital markets, but on the private market side to facilitate the growth in the country that we are seeing and also across the African continent. So this is a piece of technology that is going to be licensed across the technology. Over and above that, we do various incubator programs. Uh, we do some with the mining companies in particular trying to get them to a place where there's a lot of mining rights, uh, mining licenses that are out there, but um, there's inherently a challenge in access to capital. So for us is how do we educate the market as well in terms of how do we get your funding ready? How do we take you through that growth for us cycle? Um, to that, on the mining side, we are also pushing for some tax incentives, which will facilitate access to capital for smaller companies, just like you see in Toronto. That's a piece of work that we're doing with the Department of uh, Minerals um, at the JSC, the DMRE, um, and together with a whole bunch of um, other people in that working group. Um, so, and then over and above, we've got a separate incubator accelerator, accelerator program that is run in collaboration with um, Endeavor and also the West, the, the West Grow, um, and I think some of the other um, Western government organizations. So, as the exchange, we are going beyond our traditional um, kind of listing offering by product creation, but also facilitating access to capital for a number of smaller businesses across the country. Thank you. 
So I think we've heard some very interesting points of view from the perspective of government, but also private equity, as well as the listings on the JSC. Um, I'm going to now give each of the panelists an opportunity to do a closing remark each, um, to kind of lay out what you want the audience to take away as your last few words, and then we'll open up to some Q&A um, from the audience. So Lisa, we'll maybe start down your side and work our way back this way. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I just want to close and say that aquaculture is a very important sector. As we know, our, in terms of um, fish as a healthy source of protein, our fish stocks in the natural resources are declining. So this is the next best thing in terms of um, food safety and nutrition uh, security. Um, so we yeah, are. So aquaculture is it's a very promising and high growth area. So I'd encourage um, investment into the aquaculture sector in South Africa. And as government, as I said, we are prioritizing the development of the sector going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry, Jimmy, I don't know if you wanted to give some closing remarks on behalf of Brand SA, but maybe elevating again the pitch for South Africa as a whole. Some closing remarks from you, please. From my side, JP, I would say South Africa, as much as we are facing a number of challenges, we are dealing with those challenges. But despite that, we are actually thriving in a number of sectors. When you look at our infrastructure, whether it's our seaports, our land ports, uh, whether it's road infrastructure, whether it's the banking sector, we are still competing with the best. We are actually competing with first world countries when it comes to that. Uh, we are actually an emerging market dressed uh, in form of a first world country. So when you come into South Africa, this is what you should expect. A first, an emerging market that is similar to a first world country. We're an emerging market based on our GDP, not necessarily based on the infrastructure that we have based on our institution, even from a skills development perspective, our universities are ranked high uh, in the world. Uh, if you look at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and some of our banking, uh, our, 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 our banks in South Africa, they are ranked high in terms of their participation and comp uh, competitiveness in the global landscape. So we are a country that is actually competing with, with the rest of the world and we are here to put our best foot forward and we're saying, come and invest in South Africa, believe in us, we believe in our country, and we believe in you as an investor. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Alderman Foss, some closing remarks? Well, thanks, JP. So the city's approach <coughs> to the economy is both broad and sectoral. As you can hear from my colleague, Murray, a lot of the initiatives that we do in the Cape focuses on mobility, energy, water, the things that business needs. But what we do in Cape Town is also focus heavily on the sectoral opportunities that exist within each one of those industries from boat building to technology to clothing and textile manufacturing and so we deploy special purpose vehicles in each one of those sectors to help with investment promotion and facilitation and skills development and I think the deployment of those business partners in each one of those specific sectors have made the world's difference and we will continue investing in those sectors so that we can get more Capetonians employed and also more foreign direct investment landing in Cape Towns in those specific sectors. And so uh, that is for me an important way to unlock further potential, but also looking at land. And I think that's a, a question that we also need to talk about because my view is that a government should not become a land bank we should rather release land to the private sector to stimulate growth in new industries, in commercial ventures. And so I'm really happy to, to share with this audience that the city government uh, is looking at creative ways of releasing more land for private sector initiatives. Um, I can speak to you afterwards if you want to find out more about how we do that. But it is an important way to unlock potential within commerce, industrial ventures, in your urban spaces. So land availability for me is an important way to unlock further economic opportunity downstream. Thanks. Thank you very much. Carl, closing remarks from you, please. Yeah, I'll try and keep it short. Please, <coughs> please do not come and invest in South Africa. It makes it expensive for the rest of us. <laughs> no. Um, I think um, um, to generalize is always dangerous, but, but, but the general feeling that I have experienced is that the investment community in South Africa, for the first time in... I, I think that I know of, have realized that it needs to be a collaborative approach. Um, government is listening. The private sector is listening. 
Um, <clears throat> I also believe that the JC has lost, lost some listings, but um, in the coming years, as the private businesses grow, um, we will become an incubator for the JC again. Um, over the past few years, it's been the other way around. Um, <clears throat> but as we have been able to start getting our act together again, uh, it, the roles will be reversed. I think the macro data that people are seeing now is, um, is not a reflection of what's going on. Um, data is uh, backwards-looking, while what we're experiencing now and the forward-looking opportunities are actually very positive. Thank you, Carl. Um, Patricia, closing remarks from your side. Yeah, um, delistings are cyclical, um, and I think it is a global phenomenon in terms of what you are seeing take private. You cannot take away and negate from the fact that we've got about a trillion dollar AUM <coughs> sitting in the country. Whilst those pools of capital perhaps are allocated to certain sectors, we do have very deep and liquid capital markets. So whether you are a medium-sized or a small business looking for um, access to capital, we've got various products and services available for you in terms of private markets and um, listing. And of course, all of these things are cyclical. Um, so you can, um, so obviously there's a space for everybody to play. But I think essentially from the JSC um, is that we're looking at ways that we can facilitate growth in the country. Um, and I think we are showing that we are uh, thinking outside of our traditional mindsets in terms of access to capital. Thank you. Amy Sewinger, closing remarks, please. Uh, thank you. From the Western Cape government side, we're open for business. We have good governance, we have good infrastructure, and we have good service delivery. 80% uh, of the green tech companies that are in South Africa are headquartered in Cape Town. Uh, Cape Town is also the tech capital of Africa. We have four uh, world-class universities in our province. We have an excellent talent pool. 55% of South Africa's agricultural exports come from the Western Cape. So we really have a lot on offer and would be very happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much. So I think what we've heard presented today is there are challenges, we acknowledge them. But there are huge opportunities depending on what market you're looking at. Um, there are opportunities across different sectors and the government is trying to create an enabling environment for that investment to come in. So I'd like to now open the floor to some questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please stand up, introduce yourself, and then please let us know who you'd like to direct your question to. I hope that's a sign that we were so convincing that everyone <laughs> wants to chat to each of the individuals afterwards about signing some big deals. No questions? Okay, great. Well, we're going to wrap up, I guess, a bit early. That's probably a bit unexpected, but um, I hope we've presented uh, what you want to hear today. If there are additional questions that you haven't thought of now, I know the panelists will probably be around um, a little bit afterwards, so please do come up and approach us um, and let us know a little bit more about your businesses or your investment portfolios, um, and we'd be very happy to have a conversation and take that forward not just today, but on a, in an ongoing way. Thank you very much, everyone.